Hi, and welcome to the LIT Review Series. I'm Chris DiRienzo, a fellow in neonatal perinatal medicine at Duke Hospital, and today we'll be spending the next few minutes talking about necrotizing enterocolitis. So over the next 10 minutes or so, we'll hit the, the following four bullet points and give you a high-level review of, of necrotizing enterocolitis, from understanding its pathophysiology up through how to recognize patients with neck and then begin appropriate management. We will also cover the preventive measures that can be taken to reduce the risk of NEC. So for starters, what is NEC? Necrotizing enterocolitis is a gastrointestinal emergency predominantly affecting infants where there is significant injury to the bowel, and it can range from inflammation all the way to the picture you see here where there is truly necrotic intestine. Why neck happens, we actually still don't know. It's been described as an aberrant response of an immature gut, and has been associated with a number of different um, types of things, including, most specifically, prematurity and feeding. However, it has also been associated with prolonged recent blood transfusion, prolonged initial antibiotics, and H2 blocker therapy. Of note, we have found recently that human milk is protective, and it's one of the, the few things um, in neonatology we've had that can actually reduce incidence of neck. It is hypothesized that it is because breast milk is rich in antibodies and supports the appropriate colonization of the baby's intestinal flora. This image from a 2011 New England Journal review gives one of the, the more recently described proposed mechanisms for next pathophysiology. As you can see, it involves a number of different pathways and truly is a multi-hit hypothesis for a why babies get neck. So who gets neck? Well, by and large, this is a disease of premature infants. It is the most common cause of acute abdomen in premature infants. Uh, the peak incidence is around 24 weekers, um, and it is very rare in term babies. Uh, there are basically two kinds of neck, medical and surgical, and it's important to note that surgical neck is much more serious and carries a much higher uh, mortality and morbidity rate. A classical presentation of neck will be a two to four week old neonate on formula feeds and presents with feeding intolerance manifesting as gastric residual vomiting or diarrhea, abdominal distension manifesting as increased abdominal girth. They might also have bloody stools or rectal bleeding, be toxic and unwell manifesting as septic shock or as hypotension, lethargy, and poor perfusion manifesting as prolonged capillary refill time. This is an indication of severe neck. The initial workup should include full blood count with blood cultures, a renal panel, and ABG. Findings may include, in the FBC, typically leukocytosis. However, neutropenia might be suggestive of a poor prognosis. Thrombocytopenia may also be noted and the degree correlates with the severity of neck. ABG, where metabolic acidosis would be suggestive of severe neck. Electrolyte derangements on a renal panel secondary to metabolic acidosis. PT and PDT fibrinogen can be sent if there are clinical signs suggestive of DIC, or disseminated intravascular coagulopathy, which is a devastating complication of neck. Signs include marked thrombocytopenia and hemorrhage, bloody stools, hematuria. Note that these findings are sensitive to neck, but they are not specific. An abdominal x-ray should have been ordered concurrently to confirm neck and stage neck. The first three stages have been described by Bell's criteria. Stage 1 or suspected neck is when neck is clinically suspected in a neonate but there are no radiological findings suggestive of neck. Stage 2, or medical neck, is when radiological findings suggestive of neck is found, most notably pneumatosis intestinalis, or portal venous gas, also known as pneumatosis hepatitis. Pneumatosis intestinalis refers to gas being seen in the intramural space of intestines and is associated with ischemic bowel. It is classically noted as the string of pearls appearance. Other findings that may be noted include dilated intestinal loops due to stenosis of lower intestinal walls and increased intestinal wall thickness. Stage 3, or surgical neck, 
is characterized by pneumoperitoneum, seen on radiograph as free air under the diaphragm or air outside the bowel loops. This means that neck is complicated by bowel perforation. In the event that an abdominal x-ray is inconclusive, abdominal ultrasound may be used, and the findings that are looked for include pneumatosis intestinalis, portal venous gas, increased intestinal wall thickness. This is an image of an abdominal x-ray of a baby with NEC, with mottled lucencies or foaminess seen all over the intestines. So that brings us to management. Now, babies with medical neck are generally managed symptomatically. We stop feeding them so as to decompress and relieve the stress on the bowels to prevent perforation. Decompression can also be aided with an NGT. You can also correct any fluid or electrolyte issues that have arisen. Urgent fluid resuscitation is needed if the child has signs of shock. These babies are routinely treated with broad-spectrum antibiotics, usually ampicillin, gentamicin, with added metronidazole for anaerobic coverage. Beginning with a rule-out course, and potentially extending that to a 7 to 10 days course or beyond depending on the baby's symptoms. Routinely, we'll do a plain supine abdominal radiograph every 6 to 8 hours at first, monitoring the progression of pneumatosis and our portal venous gas. Look out for progression into type 3 or surgical neck. Generally, these babies wait a long time before beginning to feed anteriorly again, up to a week and potentially longer. As such, in the meantime, enteral feeding is replaced with parenteral feeding. The management of surgical neck is actually still controversial as there are no current consensus. Uh, generally, the two modes of, of management are either surgical drain placement at the bedside or an exploratory laparotomy that generally involves some sort of bowel resection and primary anastomosis or ostomies and mucous fistulas. There have been a, a couple of, of studies uh, that found no difference in outcomes and no difference in survival, though interestingly, one study showed some potential for long-term neurodevelopmental improvement with an X-lap. And so finally, that brings us to a more high-level management of neck within a, a unit. And so the three things that, that NICUs around the world have really come up with to help reduce overall neck rates have been first and foremost human milk, and then using antimicrobials in a, a thoughtful but certainly still aggressive manner. Let's understand some of the outcomes. Neck is a very costly disease. Overall, mortality is around 20 to 30% but that's much higher for surgical neck. This is due to perforation of intestine resulting in peritonitis and sepsis. These babies stay in the hospital longer, with surgical neck patients staying much longer than medical neck as well. Survivors are at risk of not only just neurodevelopmental impairment, but a number of other significant comorbidities. Most importantly, short gut syndrome, where there is a malabsorption of nutrition, secondary to dysfunctional gut or surgical resection of the gut. So this is truly a severe disease of prematurity. So in summary, I hope we've been able to give you uh, some high-level points about neck. You should be able to recognize neck both on your exams and in your clinical practice and, and have some thoughts about how to begin the, the workup and management, as well as to reduce the, the overall incidence of neck in your unit over time. Quiz time. Question 1. Which is not one of the management for suspected or known neck? The answer is C. Question 2. The answer is C. Question 3. In which of these children would your suspicion of neck be the highest?
Here are some key references and further reading materials.